This lecture is going to be about uniform circular motion, which is what it sounds like an object moving in a circle. Let's say that you want to make an object move in a circle. What would you need to do to it to make that happen? Well, you can't just let it continue with what it's doing without applying some force to it, because if you do that, it's just going to continue with whatever velocity it already had, according to Newton's first law. So let's say that you have this cart moving toward you with some velocity, and you want to make it move around you. And I'm going to imagine that you have this rope that you extend out to the cart. To make the cart move in a circle as it goes by you, you'd have to apply a constant net force toward the center of the circle. That would cause the cart to move in a circle. So this is based on Newton's first law, an object maintains its velocity unless acted on by a force. So if that force from you disappears at any point, the object is just going to continue off with whatever velocity it had in the moment that you let go, in whatever direction that it had in the moment that you let go. And let's say that the object had no initial velocity. If it didn't have any initial velocity to start off, and you applied this force to it, it would just be dragged toward you without any circular motion. It's just moving toward you. So this shows that there are two requirements for circular motion. The first requirement is that the net force has to be constant and always pointing toward the center of the circular path. And the second requirement is that there has to be a constant velocity at a 90 degree angle to the net force itself. So this picture on the left kind of shows you what I mean by that. So both of these things have to be true for circular motion to occur. This gives us some vocabulary that we can use to talk about circular motion. The centripetal force is a name that we give to the net force on the object that's moving in a circle. It always points toward the center of motion, and it's measured in newtons. The tangential velocity is the distance the object moves around the circle over the change in time. It's measured in meters per second. The radius of the circle is just the radius of the circular path, which is measured in meters. And the centripetal acceleration means the acceleration that points toward the center. Because acceleration always points in the same direction as the net force, that means that in circular motion, the acceleration is always going to be pointing toward the center of the circle. So this picture shows you what I mean and how these variables are related over time. So you can see that as the circle goes around, the velocity is always pointing tangent to the circular path, parallel to the circular path, and the net force and acceleration are always pointing toward the center of the path. A common misconception about centripetal force is students often think that centripetal force is a type of force, like there's centripetal force and there's the force of gravity, there's the normal force, but that's not correct. Centripetal force is just the net total force that always points toward the center of motion, and any force can add together to make it. So as an example, when Earth is orbiting around the sun, gravity is the centripetal force. So the centripetal force is just a name that we give to whatever force happens to be pointing toward the center constantly. Um, there's no such thing as a type of force called centripetal force. That's always made up of other types of forces. So some students are also confused about why the acceleration always points toward the center of the circle, whereas the velocity is always pointing tangent to the circle. One way to think about this is that the net force points toward the center, and acceleration always points in the same direction as the net force. A second way is to watch the vector animation that's happening above my head. You can see that because acceleration is the change in velocity, it's causing velocity to always change toward the center of the circle. So the velocity continues to turn around, and that's why circular motion is maintained. If acceleration pointed in the same direction as velocity, the object would just continue along that straight line path. Another common misconception about centripetal acceleration is that it means that the object is getting faster and faster around the circle, but that's also not true. The role of the centripetal acceleration is to change the direction of the velocity, but it doesn't change the magnitude of the velocity, just the direction. So the velocity is staying at a constant rate, it's not getting bigger or smaller, the acceleration is just changing its direction as it turns around the circle. Two more vocabulary words that you'll need to describe circular motion are period and frequency. Period is the amount of time an object takes to complete one full cycle. We use the word period to describe a lot of different things. For example, class periods are cycles that repeat over a given amount of time. And just like that, a period in physics is just the amount of time that any cycle in physics takes to repeat. Here, in circular motion specifically, it means how long the object takes to go around the circle once. And it's always measured in seconds, and the unit for it is capital T. Frequency is the amount of repetitions a cycle completes in one second. So here in circular motion, frequency means how many times the object goes around the circle in one second. Frequency is measured in hertz, or hz. hz just means events per second. So period is how long it takes for an event to repeat once, and frequency is how many events repeat in one second. So there's an interesting relationship there. 
where the period is always going to be equal to 1 over the frequency. This is always going to be true. I'm going to give you a visual that's going to help you understand why. Let's say that you're going around a circular path and it takes you 4 seconds to go around the path altogether. Because it takes you four seconds to repeat this cycle once, that's your period. The period is four seconds long because that's the time it takes to repeat. The frequency is the amount of repetitions completed in one second. And if you look at my visual, you can see that in just one second, one fourth of the total circle has been covered. So that means that the circle is being covered at one fourth rotations per second. So the frequency here is gonna be one fourth. And you can see from this that no matter what fraction I choose, the period is always going to be equal to 1 over the frequency. So here the period is 4 and the frequency is 1 fourth and that is always going to be true. So if you have the period of some circular motion, you also have the frequency. One more important vocab word is angular velocity. I'm going to compare that to tangential velocity with this animation. In this animation you can see I have a car driving in circular motion. And next to the car's path, you can see I put a boy sitting on some playground equipment that also spins in a circle. So when I make these two things start to spin, you can see that they're both spinning around the circle, but the car is covering a lot more distance over the same amount of time. So that means that the car has a much larger velocity than the boy. If you look down at the car's speedometer and looked at how fast the boy was going, you would see that the car is going much faster than the boy. So that's tangential velocity. That's how fast it's actually moving in meters per second. So you can see that the velocity of the car is much greater than the velocity of the boy. But there's another part of circular motion that we can look at where these two things are actually equal to each other. So the angular velocity is just the change in angle around a circle over the change in time. It's measured in radians per second. So it's a measurement of how many radians around a circle you go per second. So even though the boy's circular path is much smaller than the car's circular path, if you watch how many degrees or radians they go around the circle in a given amount of time, you can see that it's actually the same. They're covering the same angle of their respective circles in the same amount of time. That's useful information, so we record that in physics as a separate variable angular velocity. That W symbol is actually in omega, so when you're drawing that you just need to make sure the two sides curl in like that. So you can see here that the angular velocity of the car, how much of an angle it covers over time, is actually equal to the angular velocity of the boy, even though the velocity, the actual tangential velocity of the car is much greater than the velocity of the boy. The car is much faster, but it goes around the circle at the same rate as the boy goes around his circle. So the angular velocity is the same, but the tangential velocity is different. So that was it for definitions for the first part of this unit. I'm going to show you the equations for this unit and where we get I'm going to start with an equation for the tangential velocity around the circle. We know that in general velocity is displacement over time. Here the object is going all the way around the circle once, and if the circle has a radius r, we know that the total distance that this object covered is equal to 2 pi r. That's the circumference of the circle. And based on our previous definition, we know that the time that it takes to complete one full circle is equal to the period of motion. The period is the amount of time in seconds that the object takes to rotate around the full circle. So our first equation that we're going to be using a lot is that the tangential velocity of any object is equal to 2 pi r over the period of motion, like that. And because period is 1 over frequency, we can rewrite that equation as tangential velocity is equal to 2 pi r times the frequency. So that's the first equation we're going to use. The second equation is for angular velocity. We know that angular velocity is the change in degree over time, or radians per second. And I know that if this object goes all the way around the circle, it covers 2 pi radians in that time. And the time that it takes to do that is the period. So that's going to be 2 pi over t is the angular velocity. And because t is 1 over f, I can rewrite that as 2 pi f. So that's an equation for angular velocity. And I'm going to keep this period and frequency equation up here as well. The next thing you might notice is that the tangential velocity is actually equal to the angular velocity multiplied by the radius. Each equation for the tangential velocity is actually equal to each equation for the angular velocity multiplied by the radius. So this equation is going to hold true. This is an equation for the centripetal acceleration of the object, how much it's accelerating toward the center of its circular path. I'm not going to prove that in this video, it's a little complicated, but if you're interested in knowing where it comes from, I've left a proof in the description of the video. So centripetal acceleration, acceleration toward the center of motion, is equal to the tangential velocity squared over r. 
and the centripetal force on an object is the net force. So just like in regular straight line physics, the net force is equal to m times a, here the centripetal force is equal to mass times the centripetal acceleration, which is also equal to mass times v squared over r. So in conclusion, this is all the new vocabulary for the unit. There's a lot, but once you get used to using it, each individual idea is pretty straightforward. I'm going to end the video with two examples of circular motion problems and what they look like. A thousand kilogram car takes four seconds to turn from north to west around a corner. If the radius of curvature of the road is 30 meters, what force of friction do the car's wheels apply? So we can imagine this car going around the circle, and the force that's taking the place of the centripetal force here is going to be the force of friction. This is because it has to be some force pointing toward the center of the car's circular path, so that has to be some horizontal force. And the only horizontal force that can exist here is some push from the road itself, which kind of makes sense because if the road is slippery, if there's ice, it's much more difficult to turn. Your car just keeps going with whatever velocity it already has. So the force that's acting as the centripetal force here is the force of friction. So we know that that is what we're trying to solve for. This says that the radius of curvature of the road is 30 meters, which means that if this curve continued to curve into a complete circle, that circle would have a radius of 30. So that's gonna be important for our calculations. The mass of the car is 1,000 kilograms. And because it takes four seconds to turn from north to west, I know that that's going to be one quarter, that turn is one quarter of the total circle that you're seeing. So if that takes four seconds to turn, altogether the total circle would take 16 seconds for the car to turn around. So the period of motion here is going to be 16 seconds. So I have the radius, the mass, the period, and I need to find the centripetal force. So looking at my centripetal force equation, I'm probably going to need to solve for what Vt is, because I can plug in my mass and I can plug in my radius. And I know that Vt by itself is equal to 2 pi r over capital T. So plugging that stuff in, I get 11.8 meters per second. Plugging that into the original equation, I get that the centripetal force on the car is 4,641 newtons. A lot of the unit is going to be like this, where you're picking out individual pieces of information and plugging it into equations. There are some parts that are very conceptual, but a lot of it is just learning to recognize which variable is what and plugging in the information correctly. Here's example two. The distance from the Earth to the Sun is 149.6 million kilometers. How fast is the Earth moving around its orbit? What is the Earth's acceleration toward the Sun? So this is an example of a problem that gives us some context clues for solving it. We're trying to find the tangential velocity and the centripetal acceleration of the Earth. And we're given the radius of Earth's circular path. Because if the distance from the Earth to the Sun is that far, and the Sun is in the center of the Earth's orbit, that's also going to be the radius of the Earth's orbit. This is going to come up a lot. So if I convert that number to scientific notation and convert it to meters, I get 1.496 times 10 to the 11th meters for the radius of that circular path. So to solve for the tangential velocity, I need the radius and the period. And the problem doesn't give me the period, but I actually know that using the context of the problem, because the period is how long in seconds the object takes to go around the circular path once. And I know that it takes the Earth one year to complete its circular path. That's what a year is. So a year is 365 days, so I just need to convert that to seconds. And when I do that, I get that the period is 3.15 times 10 to the seventh seconds. Plugging that into 2 pi r over t, I get 2.98 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. And the centripetal acceleration is just v squared over r, so just plugging in my numbers here, I get this very small acceleration for Earth. It makes sense that it's accelerating at such a small rate because it's only changing its direction at a very small rate, because it takes a full year to completely change its velocity's direction all the way around the circle. So that's how you solve circular motion problems. A lot of it is just going to be drawing out those variables, plugging them into the equations, and finding missing information.